Hi everyone, welcome to episode 7 of Mr. Mobby's Home Learning Series. Uh, this week, <coughs> excuse me, this week we're going to be looking at adaptations in plants. And of course by now, uh, before getting stuck into this um, extra resource and extra video, uh, you would have done the pre-reading um, and made some notes uh, from the textbook pages. So this is to support that and to get us thinking a little bit more deeply and think about some specific examples. Um, of adaptations in plants. So just to get us started off, uh, we've got a, a little uh, something to get us thinking about um, this, this part of the course. So state how plant adaptations may vary from animal adaptations. Of course, last week we were looking at animal adaptations. How do they vary? Okay, think about that in terms of the demands that are placed on animals compared to plants. Um, using your knowledge of the leaf, because um, we studied that in photosynthesis, Suggest how desert plants might conserve water. Okay, and have a think about that. So pause the video and let's have a think. Okay, getting into the learning outcomes then, explain why plants need to reduce water loss by transpiration. Why is that? We looked at the transpiration stream before. Um, why do plants need to reduce that water loss? Uh, describe how plant adaptation allows it to survive in its habitat, different plant adaptations, and describe one example of a plant adaptation. Um, and we've got some questions to have a go at today just to try and put into practice what you've read and what you've made notes of. Uh, so we've got some key keywords here, stomata, which we um, have, are familiar with from when we looked at the leaf, evaporation, surface area, and of course transpiration. Uh, movement of water through the plant from the roots and out through the leaves, the transpiration stream. So, for those of you interested, this is the link to the specification, so you can pause the video and have a read through that should you wish. And into this kind of first statement, so really we're thinking about what, what do plants need? You know, plants and animals are adapted in various ways depending on the de demands of their environment and what they require to survive. So we, we can think about the different adaptations a plant will have depending on what um, the plants need. And of course plants need light, they need carbon dioxide, water, space to grow, mineral ions, and they must also produce lots of glucose in order to grow. Of course plants are producers. They make their own food, okay, using energy from the sun in photosynthesis to make their own glucose. And of course that glucose is in almost used for uh, growth and for building other molecules. Okay, so that's the kind of key difference really. You know, animals will gather their own food, they are consumers, they consume their food. Whereas plants are producers, they make their own food. So we can have a nice little cross link to the other topics there and think about, well, if plants are producers compared to animals being consumers, how are the adaptations going to vary? So using your knowledge of the leaf suggests how desert plants might conserve water. Now, of course, if we think about different environments, okay, and we think about the rainforest, for example, there'll be lots of broad leaves, okay, because um, of the humidity in that environment. And so that will affect how much water is lost. A very large surface area of a leaf will be able to lose the water, okay, and control it through the leaf. However, of course, in the very dry conditions where um, plants need to retain that water because there's not, you know, the availability of water is very, very sparse, then broad leaves would be a very poor adaptation to be to have in the um, desert. And so we know that a cactus, for example, has water storage tissues in the stem rather than leaves. And it also has those spikes okay, to protect itself from animals. Okay, that require the water. So key adaptations there, if we think about just examples from very um, humid conditions where the, you'll see broad leaves, to very dry conditions where you see no leaves, for example, in the cactus. Okay, so we've got a short video here just to kind of link to the transpiration stream and remind us about the transpiration stream. Transpiration is the evaporation of water from the aerial parts of the plant so the leaves and stems. By water evaporating out of these parts, mostly the leaves, 
A suction pressure is created which draws up the water through the plant. This is called the transpiration pull. But what exactly happens in transpiration? Let's start at the roots. Roots have root hairs, giving them a large surface area for water absorption. Water passes in from the soil by osmosis, passing down the concentration gradient and into the root hair cell's cytoplasm and then onto the xylem vessels. Water moves through the xylem vessels from the root to the stem to the leaf. Transpiration at the leaf causes a transpiration pull and because water molecules are cohesive, water is pulled up through the plant in the transpiration stream. As well as the leaf cells needing water for photosynthesis, water also keeps the cells turgid, which supports the plant. Inside the leaves, water is drawn out of the xylem cells to replace the water lost through transpiration. Because of the cohesive nature of water, which also pulls the water through the plant, as water leaves the xylem and moves into the leaf, it again pulls more water molecules behind it. But it isn't just about water. The transpiration stream also transports mineral ions that are dissolved in the water from the roots to the leaves. The transpiration rate isn't constant. There are many different factors that affect it. The environmental factors are similar to those that make you sweaty. The temperature, the humidity, but also wind and light intensity. Then there are also physical factors, like does it have a waxy cuticle? How many stomata does it have? The nature of the guard cells how large is the leaf surface area and if the leaf is folded or flat. If the rate of transpiration increases, then the rate of water absorption by the roots needs to increase too. When water is scarce or if the roots are damaged, the plant needs to reduce its transpiration rate by closing some of their stomata. There are guard cells on either side of the stomata which regulate this. During daylight hours, chloroplasts produce sugar. This lowers the water potential of the guard cells and they take in water by osmosis. This makes the guard cells turgid because the guard cells have a different cell wall thickness. When turgid, they bend more on the outside into sausage shapes. This opens the stomata or the pore. Water can then be lost. During the night, all the sugar produced by the chloroplasts gets used up so the water potential of the guard cells increases. More water, less sugar. The guard cells lose water by osmosis and become flaccid and the stomata starts to close. This reduces water loss. So you now know about water movement through the plant, up the xylem, and pulled along the transpiration stream by the transpiration pull. And unsurprisingly, the plant has methods to control water loss by closing the stomata, based upon how flaccid or turgid the guard cells are. So in the final part of this video, we are going to look at the movement of glucose. After all, water may be important, but so is food. Okay, so that was like a reminder then um, of the transpiration, of transpiration and the transpiration stream. So if you want to go back through that little video and make some little reminder notes, that's that's absolutely fine. So we've got a little question here, um, just to kind of bring this together. So just pause the video, have a go at this question. Describe how plants lose water from their leaves. Describe that process. Use knowledge from the video and describe that process of how water is lost from the leaves. Try and use as many key terms as possible. And of course, we can then link this, if you want to just think about this a bit further, using your answer in the question above, explain why this makes living in a dry place such a problem. So pause the video, have about five minutes to have a go at that question. Okay, it's so just going through the answers here then. So describe how plants lose water from the leaves. Plants lose water from the leaves when water evaporates from the leaf cells into the surrounding air spaces. Water vapour also moves by diffusion down a concentration gradient through the stomata into the surrounding air. And good to like bring in that key word of stomata there. That is how the water is lost. And evaporation there is another key word. Using your answer in the Question above, explain why this makes living in a dry place such a problem. Well, dry places uh, are often hot, so photosynthesis and res respiration are going to occur at a faster rate due to that increase in temperature. Because 
water vapour is going to be lost more quickly at a higher temperature. So just to give you guys a bit more of a challenge here, um, again, you know, this, this extra resource here um, is going to be lots of questions here to kind of bring, bring your reading together and your note taking together. So make sure that you've, um, you're going to choose um, and complete two of these tasks based on where you think you're at with this topic. Um, so we've got the, the, the mild level, the medium level and the hot level. And you can pause the video and have a go at these questions and we'll go for the answers in a minute. If you want to go back through the reading on pages 272, 273, uh, to remind yourself, we'll go back through your um, notes as well before you have a go at these. That might be a good idea. Okay, so take some time now to read the questions and, and think about which ones do you want to have a go at. Okay, so <clears throat> first one, climate, hot, dry environments. Um, so identify the climate in which curled leaves may be found in plants and describe how it reduces water loss. Well, the curled leaves reduce the surface area. A lot of this is about surface area, as was mentioned in the beginning of this video. Okay, smaller surface area will decrease transpiration or the rate of transpiration. This also, the curled leaves also traps a layer of moist air around the leaf to reduce the amount of water loss from their leaves okay if we've got moist air directly outside of the leaf we've got a, a, a shallower concentration gradient therefore less water will be lost okay so you can relate that to rates of, of um, diffusion of water vapor so it cuts down the area from which the water could be lost any three from for the second question so plants living in dry conditions have adaptations to reduce um, Water loss from their uh, leaves, I should say. <laughs> Give three of these and explain how they work. So, curled leaves, we've got reduced surface area, trapped moist air. Small leaves, again, reduce the surface area. Uh, thick cuticle, remember that thick waxy cuticle is there to reduce the rate of evaporation of the leaf. Um, and we've got stem like leaves as well, reduce the number of stomata to minimize the water loss by diffusion into air. And remember, it's about water vapor here, so it's diffusion. Um, and of course, this idea of fewer stomata is really, really important. If you have stem-like leaves, there's going to be much, much fewer, if any, stomata. More difficult question. Describe and explain three other adaptations seen in plants to help them survive in dry conditions. So we've got extensive root system. Of course, all uh, cacti will have um, an extensive root system, maximising the water uptake. And it might be worth just thinking about why. If you've got much more extensive root system, not only going deeper into the ground to get the water, if you have more roots, you will have more root hairs, therefore a larger surface area on those roots, which will maximize the absorption of water. Okay, so again, this is relating again to surface area. So if you want to take that a bit further, that'd be really good. Long roots go very deep, okay maximizing water uptake from the soil but again you can bring in surface area there more roots more root hairs more surface area more water absorption and of course water storage tissues um, to store water in the fleshy leaves stems roots after rain such as a cactus <clears throat> and we've got a little fat file here i know some of you um have been doing some extra kind of research i know um, i've been speaking to uh, kezi on, on q a on the Fridays, we've had some really nice discussions about the examples that are in these. So do have a look at some other examples, do some further wider reading. Um, and this is an example here, and a key, some interesting facts here about this particular cactus. <clears throat> okay, another little video here. Uh, this time talking about rainforest. So what are the biggest challenges for plants in the rainforest? Well firstly, ensuring that future generations survive. This involves pollination, fertilisation, seed dispersal and the germination of seeds, each of which presents their own set of challenges. There are a whole host of pests and diseases that plants have to contend with in the rainforest. Being eaten and getting mould growing on your leaves must be prevented. There is also competition from other plants for resources, such as nutrients and light. 
And lastly, it's not called the rainforest for nothing, there's a great deal of water about, and so avoiding waterlogging presents a significant challenge. So let's go and have a look at some of the clever adaptations that plants have developed to cope with this extreme environment. Welcome to the pitcher plant. No, not a pitcher of a plant, the pitcher plant. Soils in the rainforest are actually very poor in nutrients, but the pitcher plant has developed an ingenious adaptation to help it gain extra nutrients and survive. It attracts insects into the pitcher using nectar. However, once the insects are inside, they find it very hard to get out. This is because the walls are smooth and they're waxy. They end up in the fluid at the bottom of the pitcher. Now this fluid is thought to contain microorganisms and enzymes which digest the insects and then the plant absorbs those extra nutrients. Things that end up in the pitcher are usually invertebrates and small insects, but it has been reported that small rodents have even been found in these pitchers. Now the next plant I want to show you is really popular with our visitors, that is once they realise what it can do. Have a look and see what happens when I touch one of these leaves. Now there's several theories as to why the plant does this. It may be a defence from herbivores, either because the plant looks less appetising once it's wilted, or the herbivores may be scared off by a fast moving plant. It's also possible that the leaves closing up in this manner is protection against heavy tropical rainfall. enough light for photosynthesis can be a real issue for rainforest plants but there is a group of cheeky little plants that have found a way to get around this they're called epiphytes now epiphytes are plants which grow on other plants like this one here now they do this non-parasitically so it means that this plant isn't actually damaging the tree that it's growing on it does this so it can get further up and closer to the light these epiphytes are able to get their moisture and nutrients from the air and the rainwater around them and they're also able to get nutrients from debris which starts to accumulate around the plant. Epiphytes are the ultimate plant hitchhikers. So why might a person be wearing something like this? Well, apart from having absolutely no fashion sense, they'd probably be trying to attract the attention of others. In much the same way, flowers use bright coloured petals and scents to attract pollinators. At the end of the day, if the flowers don't get pollinated, then the plant won't be able to reproduce and the species won't survive. So this is vitally important. I think he said to us about mangroves. Now mangroves grow on tropical coasts with soft soils. They're an incredibly important ecosystem, offering a nursery ground for many species of fish. They also trap sediment that's been washed off the land that would otherwise smother coral reefs. In addition to that, they offer some protection during events such as tsunamis. However, there are some unique challenges for plants trying to survive in this habitat. First of all, they're going to be flooded by seawater each day, and the seawater will have high salinity. They also have to deal with the actions of tides, winds and waves and on top of that they have to deal with water and mud which can be very low in oxygen. Now in terms of dealing with salt, well some species of mangroves are what we call salt excluders and they actually filter out the salt from the water that's being absorbed by the roots. Some species are what we call salt excretors. These species push the salt into dead and dying leaves which eventually drop off the plant. So they're basically using those leaves like rubbish bags. And last but not least, mangroves have specially adapted roots. They have some which come down from the stem and go into the mud and these act to stabilise the plant. These are called prop roots. And they also have pneumatophores. These come up from the roots underneath the mud and act like snorkels. Their function is to suck air down into the root system because oxygen levels in the mud can be extremely low. The 
Traveller's Palm is one of the most eye-catching plants that we have in our rainforest biome, and it's got some fairly obvious adaptations. Firstly, the leaves are huge, they're much bigger than me, and they act like giant solar panels, maximising the amount of sunlight that can be absorbed for photosynthesis. Also, in the wild, these leaves line up in an east-west direction, again to maximise sunlight absorption. Stores of water can also be found in the stems, but if you're a lost traveller, make sure you work out which way is east and west before you chop one of these stems down for a drink. The plants that we've seen today have taken millions of years to evolve the adaptations needed to survive in this extreme environment. They're unique and they're highly specialised for life here. The question is though, which plants will be the winners and losers as climates change and what might be the knock-on effects for us humans? Okay, really interesting uh, video there uh, from greentalent.org. So you might want to go back through that video and you can jot down maybe some, some other examples just from the video, two or three examples from the video um, of those specific plants with those specific adaptations. Uh, because that'd be really, really interesting to have these. Um, I'm going to have this task here um, as an optional task. Okay, and you can send this to me um, on the Teams. Um, so we'll have this as an optional task because we have got quite a bit of work to do this week. So um, in this question, you, it's like a yeah, six part question. So we've got plants and animals have uh, been adapt, have become adapted in many different ways uh, to reduce the risk of being eaten by predators. Describe these adaptations, give examples of animals and plants adapted in the ways you describe. So again, we'll have this as an optional task and you can send it to me um, via Teams. Okay, um, what I'll do is set up uh, an assignment, an, an optional assignment for you to submit um, these uh, questions to me to have a look at. Okay, and um, we'll have that as an optional task. So I'll set that up and send that to you guys. Here's some guidance then on kind of the uh, marks that you can um, have. So there are clear and detailed description of the range of adaptations of named animals and, and plants. It is clear how most of these adaptations help the organism to avoid being eaten. So it'd be worth just having a think about that if you want to have a go. That's an optional task. Um, we're just going to pop up here kind of some examples um, that you may want to use in your answer. So you can pause the video and have a look at these there. A couple more application questions um, just to put this into practice as well. Certainly there's more sort of application questions uh, going on uh, in the exam, so good to practice these. So air plants are sold in garden centres as easy to keep plants. You can see some examples there. They are found growing naturally on branches near the top of the rainforest trees. Many have water storage tissues and hairy leaves. Explain why these rainforest plants need dry adaptations, for example. Explain why garden centres sell air plants as easy to keep plants. So, have a go. Think about what we've covered in this video. Think about what we have covered in the reading as well and the examples we've looked at and have a go at these application questions. So pause the video, have a go. Okay, so we've got some <coughs> answers here. So sunny at the top from question one. Sunny at the top of the tall trees and therefore plants will dry out easily. Um, very windy at the top of the trees and so water will evaporate easily and there's no soil on the top of the trees so can't take water in from the surroundings. Air plants are easy to keep because they don't need watering every uh, very often. Simple. Okay, so thanks everybody for that video. Um, if you want to pause it and go back through the bits and pieces and have a, and check those questions, also perhaps maybe try the more challenging questions. And I'll put a team's assignment um, for that six mark question as an optional task for you guys to do um, and we, I can give some feedback on those answers as well. Okay, thanks everyone. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe. See you on Teams.